Welcome to Life Stories with me, Des Tong. Now, my guest today is a singer-songwriter with, for me, uh, one of the most distinctive voices in popular music. Colin Blunston, welcome to Life Stories. Thanks, Des. Thank you. I've always had an absolute... Oh, it, I, I just, when I heard your voice, it was, it was amazing. It, it was just this, it was totally different to all the other voices around. How did you, how did you find that voice? You know, was it a, uh, did you, you know, did you sort of think, um, I want to be, sound, I want to sound like the Stones, or, but then you couldn't, or, or was it just? Uh, no, I think mostly, uh, in my career, when I look back, so much of it was chance, really. Um, I was introduced to the guys in a local band that became the Zombies, and I played a little bit of guitar, and that was my that was my way into the band. And I joined as a rhythm guitarist, and I happened to hear Rod Argent, who was going to be the lead vocalist, play keyboards, and I said to him, I said, "You've got to play keyboards in this band." I mean, he even we were 15 years old, but he was a sensational player. Mm. And um, he wasn't keen, but then a bit later on in that same first rehearsal, he heard me sing a Ricky Nelson song, just, uh, just to myself, I was just messing about. Never can remember what that song was. <laughs> it probably Poor Little Fool or It's Late or something like that. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you'll be the lead singer, I'll be the keyboard player. And that's how I got my break of being a lead singer. I had no idea I'd really got a voice up until that point. So this was right back. Let's let's go right back. So this was yeah. like St Albans. Yes. Um, you were born in Hertfordshire. Hatfield. Yeah, I was born in Hatfield, just up the road. Uh, all the guys in the band, the the common denominator was that we all went to school in St Albans. Right. Not the same school, but we all went, and and there were connections how we got to know one another. Um. Uh, um we started out on an Easter Saturday morning. We met outside the Blacksmith's Arms in St. Peter's Street. We were too young to meet in the pub. We were mm. only 15, so we couldn't go in the pub. And at that first meeting, as I said, I turned up to be the rhythm guitarist. Right. I know you were in the choir. Okay. Rob was in the cathedral choir. Right. And, and that's one, it's a great advantage for us because uh, uh, not only most keyboard players are pretty good at working out harmonies, but, mm. but he spent sort of... 10 or 12 years in the cathedral choir, so he's got that added um, plus of, of knowing harmony from singing in a cathedral choir as well. And I think there was always a strong point with the Zombies, right from the very beginning, our first rehearsals. It was quite unfashionable, really, but we concentrated on harmonies. And of course, right. we were always a keyboard-based band. So whether you liked us or you didn't like us, we were different. We yeah. were keyboard-based, and we we put a, quite an emphasis on harmonies. When you were at school, did you did you have any inclination? I mean, what prompted this this move? You know, did you have like music lessons, and you realised you could sing, or, or, or no? Or it's what? nothing like that. To, to to be absolutely honest, at my school we sat in alphabetical order, and the guy in front of me was a guy called Paul Arnold. So A sat in front of B. And Paul Arnold was a neighbour of Rod Argent's. There's no way I could have ever known Rod Argent. He didn't come to my school. I didn't know where he lived or anything. But they'd got the idea of putting a band together. And the guy who sat in front of me knew I had a guitar. And that was my introduction to the band. It was, it, as I said, you know, so much of it is just chance. Yeah, you know? yeah. I know Rod wrote She's Not There. It did. It really surprised me. I, did, I had no idea he could write a song. And we got our first session coming up for Decca, and we had a producer who just mentioned, just as an aside, we were going to do some R&B classics. And he said, you know, we've got this session coming up, you could always write something for it. And then he went on and spoke about other things, and I forgot about that completely. Mm. But Rod didn't, and two days later he came back and he got She's Not There. And we all knew immediately that that was a special song. We recorded it on that first session, and it was a worldwide number one hit. It's it's amazing, isn't it? You know, the, I know when I was growing up, the, there was never the emphasis on writing music. It no, was there wasn't. You, you did everybody else's stuff, and yet there was a guy who I, I know really well, Graham Gouldman in Manchester, Absolutely. and, and Graham used to write yeah. with his dad. Yeah, you know, and and he he was only really really young, and when you think about it, you know, you you. you I'm almost learning to play while he's writing songs. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, 
And now think, he's a very rich man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> writing is it's a wonderful thing for credibility and also financially because there are no expenses, comparatively few expenses with writing. Whereas if you're in a band, of course you've got a manager and yeah. an agent, hotels, flights, yeah. the band have got to split the money. So writers usually do very well yeah, financially. Yeah. Um, so, so no, so let's go. So we, we're now, you, you've, you've got this band, you've got uh, She's Not There. Yeah. It goes to number one in America. Yep. Um, you're, what, 19 years of age? By say? then I was just 19. 19 yeah, I was 18 when we recorded it. So how, how did that feel? How did that feel to it, you? It felt in, incredible. I mean, maybe a little bit scary, really, because we arrived in New York with the national number one record, and we played at a thing called... Murray the Kay's Brooklyn Fox Christmas show. I mean, he Murray the Kay claimed to be the fifth Beatle. He was a, a huge star in America, yeah. based in New York, and he, he was a very influential DJ. And he used to put these shows on, certainly at Christmas, I think at Easter as well. And as was the tradition then, there would be sort of 14 acts on the bill. So there was Dionne Warwick and the Shirelles, Benny King, Chuck Jackson, it's Shangri-Las, many, many huge stars, mm. and us. <laughs> Patti LaBelle was another one who was absolutely wonderful. And we were, a, you know, a, a little bit on edge about how we would be accepted, but there was a great camaraderie because uh, these shows they started on Christmas Day, so everyone was away from their home on Christmas Day. And I think we did six or seven shows a day. Mind you, you only did a couple of songs. You came on and did a couple yeah. of songs. Yeah. And then, because there are 15 acts, you know, so even a couple of songs took quite a long time, uh, if everyone did a couple of songs. Um, so you were there all day. So backstage was party time. You know, it was, it was fantastic. Mm. So although we were a little bit, uh, as I say, on edge before it started, once, this, once we got going, we got to know everyone, and it, it was really, really good fun, and uh, we all thoroughly enjoyed it. And that was the beginning, really, of a quite a close relationship between the zombies and America, mm -hmm. because ever since then, we've, we've kept going back. And usually now, with the, this incarnation of the zombies, we usually go at least three times a year. Wow. It's a big place to play, though, isn't it? It's a big place to play, <laughs> and of course, you know, uh, the next time we go, we'll be playing... Uh, in and around the, the northeast and around right. New York. Um, we've just played down in the south um, uh, earlier this year uh, with the Moody Blues, actually. The Moody Blues have a, a, a yearly cruise in the Caribbean. The, the, the um, Moody Blues cruise, It's The yeah. Moody Blues cruise, yeah. and we usually do it with them. I Fantastic. think they've done it three times, and we've done it all three times. A wonderful experience, again, with a lot of camaraderie, because you're on a cruise ship with your audience, so you're living mm. amongst your audience, but you're also living with all the other bands, right. so you get to know them. You know, uh, Christopher Cross was on the, wow. the last yeah. uh, cruise. Well, I, I'm a huge fan of his. Mm. You know, it's great to have a, a long, in-depth chats with him. Brilliant. But the thing was, so you've got number one in the states. You yep. come back and you split up. Well, we we had more than one number one. I mean, there, there was a three-year career. And when you're 19 years old, three years seems like a lifetime. And at the end of three years, I think we all thought it was time to move on to other projects. And it just seemed to be a very natural... Looking back, I don't understand it at all. <laughs> yeah. Because we just completed a, a, an album that went on to do really well. Um, and we didn't stick around for that album to be released. I think, I think we were a, a little bit previous in, yeah, in yeah. our sort of retirement <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah 1967 we decided we would all get on and do other things right and things didn't go exactly to plan for you did it because wasn't there a time when um, if, if I remember rightly uh, you were the burglary clerk in an insurance I company. was uh, it's, this is a funny thing about being in a band we touched on songwriting just now and you often find there's a huge gap in the earnings of the songwriters in a band and the non-songwriters in a band. In the Zombies, there were three guys who didn't write. I wrote a couple of tunes, but basically we were the non-writers. We were all completely broke. Um, bands have got a great way of not earning any money. It's, it's so typical, especially of the 60s. And the three non-writers, myself, Hugh Grundy and, and Paul Atkinson, we had to get jobs, and very quickly too. I phoned up a, an employment agency and just said, have you got a job? 
and they led me towards the burglary department <laughs> in a big insurance company in the centre of London. And in a way, it was good for me, really, because I was really sad when the zombies finished. It was, mm. it was very emotional. And because I was working in this huge company and I got no idea what I was supposed to be doing, um, I couldn't dwell on the fact that the band had just finished and that part of my life was over because I was incredibly busy trying to work out what on earth I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. We'll leave it there and we'll come back in the second half and talk about Colin Blunston coming up to today. Okay. Welcome back to Life Stories with me, Des Tong, and my guest, Colin Blunston. Now, before the interval, uh, we were talking about that little hiatus of uh, working in an insurance company. Absolutely. I mean, uh, all musicians, I'm the same. I've, uh, I worked in a plastics factory once to, uh, just to make ends meet. You've got to, got to be done. It's part of the career, isn't but it? Then, but then you, you, uh, you became Neil MacArthur. I did. I didn't know if I wanted to get back in the music business. I was still a bit traumatised by the end of the zombies. And I met a wonderful producer called Mike Hurst. And he's one of those guys who takes over your life. And uh, he said, look, all right, in the evenings after the insurance job, come along to Olympic Studios, wonderful studio where mm -hmm. the yeah. Stones were recording, yeah. and uh, just sing on some tracks and see how you feel. And he, he got me to re-record She's Not There, which was a bit of a bizarre choice, really. But I was, at this point, I wasn't really convinced I was going to back, go back into the music business. So it was, for me, it was just a bit of fun. And he also had the idea of changing my name. And again, it wasn't serious for me. But She's Not There was released by Neil MacArthur. It was a small hit. And then I was stuck with the name for about a year. <laughs> yeah. And it's quite strange, you know, in your sort of mid-twenties to suddenly meet a lot of people who know you by a totally different name. Yeah. They got a, it, it was a bit difficult to get used to, but it did only last for about a year. And then I had a long chat with Chris White, the bass player from The Zombies, and he said, forget all this Neil MacArthur business. Come and record uh, with Rod Argent and myself. We'll produce you. And we signed a deal with CBS Records, and that's when I made my first solo album. That's as Colin Blunstone. As Colin Blunstone, right. yeah. I know you did, um, you did a Denny Lane song, didn't you? Yeah, Say You Don't Mind. We're, we actually used to play that live with the zombies, so we'd known that from years before. Mm. And we got the idea of using a really unusual string arrangement written by a wonderful arranger called Chris Gunning. And so on that track is a 21 piece string orchestra. There's, there's no drums, no rhythm mm. track at mm. all. The rhythm all comes from the, the strings. Yeah. And I have to say, I thought it was wonderful, but I didn't think it was remotely commercial. And I, I'm pretty good at not picking hits. <laughs> and it was released as a single, and it was a top 20 single. And, and of course, the, the, um, when Russ Ballard was on, you know, he, he was saying about, um, I don't believe in miracles. And yep. I mean, I, he said, I, I asked him about whether he, he wrote for people, and he, he said, no, I write for myself, but other people like the songs. And obviously, mm. I mean, he, but he said he was going to play it to Argent, but he didn't bother because he didn't think they'd be interested. Well, that's it. I mean, Argent really wanted to be quite edgy and quite tough in their music, and they would they would almost certainly have turned that song down. And there mm. were a couple of other songs that they did turn down that came to me, and I was very grateful. <laughs> um, I went round to Russ's house, because uh, obviously he was working with Rod Argent and Chris White in, in Argent, mm. and Rod and Chris were working with, on my solo career as producers. And uh, so I got to know Russ, I went round to his house, and he played me that song, and I just loved it. He just mm. sat down and played it to me on the, on the piano. And uh, I really loved it, and I was fortunate enough to be able to record it. I know I touched on it earlier on about about you, your style of voice. Mm. When you're singing live, is it is it ever a problem to hear yourself? Well, I t I've had a real lifesaver in the last few years, where the, uh, people are now using a lot of uh, they call them in ear monitors, yeah. so that I'll be uh, I'm hearing myself through a little in ear piece on, mm. on both sides. And generally, I just have my voice in there. Right. I've, different people have different ways of doing it, but I can hear the band 
very well. And it's, it's allowed me to sing more within myself. Mm. I think for years I was shout, I used to come off stage and say to the guys, you know, was I shouting mm. then? Because bands can be so loud. <laughs> but with these in-ear monitors, it's, it's really saved my voice, I think. And uh, I wouldn't want to work without them now. Mm. So you, you've now got your career up and running again as Colin Blunston. Yeah. And then did the zombies come back in again? It was kind of like that. In 1997, I started playing live again with Don Airy, who's now the keyboard player in Deep Purple. Yeah. Yeah. Don had an idea that I should get back out playing live. I don't know where this came from. I knew him, but not that well. And he just started calling me and saying, you should get out and play live again. And eventually he talked me around. He said, fine, I'll put a band together for you. Wonderful players. I didn't have to do anything. And we went out and we played for about two years. Don and I and then he moved on to do other things and eventually I managed to get Rod to come out Rod Argent to come out and play six dates with me he said I'll, I'll do six dates I'm not doing any more but we enjoyed it so much that was in 1999 and here we are we're still playing mm. in 2016 mm. um, and that idea of him and I playing over a period of years evolved into the present incarnation of the zombies. We were really surprised to find that there was a huge worldwide interest in the zombies repertoire. It wasn't our idea to reform the zombies at all, mm. um, but people kept asking us to play more and more zombie tunes. And so we did. Often they were asking for very obscure tunes that we might have only ever played in the studio, never played live ourselves. So we had to relearn these songs to play them. It was quite interesting. And there's been quite a lot of compilations released as well, hasn't there? They have, it? yeah. I, um, I think that's helped to keep the name alive, really, because we only ever recorded two albums. But there have been so many compilations, you know, the B-sides, mm. the A-sides, mm. the, the sides that weren't A-sides yeah, and yeah. B-sides and, and so on. And of course, our last album, Odyssey and Oracle, uh, Rolling Stone named it as one of the top 100 albums of all time. And when you see the other albums that are in that top 100 around you, you realise you know, they're all wonderful classic albums. So it was a huge honour and thrill that, that that album was named amongst that company, you know, the, mm. the wonderful albums that were in there. It's great that you've got you've got two careers, haven't you? you I know? have. I mean, it, it's nice to be able to to do that, and then you come back and you can just have a, a few few tours with with as Colin Blunston. Yeah, it's it's an ideal situation actually. The, I suppose the only sometimes you get a bit complicated where, when uh, you find you've got yourself double booked, and then you <laughs> you've got to duck and dive a bit there. But you can cross over, can't you? I mean, do you do like for instance, you've got you've got your gig coming up at, at the Robin. Do you do well? You must do Zombies tunes. Uh, well, I try to um, keep them fairly separate. I probably do two zombie tunes out right. of 24 right. songs. I do usually do She's Not There and Time yeah. of the Season. Because that was, that was on an advert, wasn't it, She's Not There? It was. Uh, it's uh, the Chanel. The Chanel it's, That was a worldwide commercial for Chanel. And well, if you're going to get it on an advert, you might as well know, go for a big one. Well, I know. <laughs> anybody who knows anything about, about commercials, they know that that pays incredibly yes. well. Yeah. And Kyra Knightley was the lady who uh, was the, the featured artist in that commercial. Yeah. So it was a wonderful thing for us. Uh, uh, we're lucky because a lot of the Zombies material have from time to time been used in commercials and in major films as well. Right. Um, and that's a great, if, you know, if as, as you get to our age, it gets harder and harder to have a hit record. Hmm. But hmm. another way to, f to get your profile to grow is to get your songs into commercials and into films. Yeah. And people actually kind of think that you've had a hit again, because they, they're so familiar with it yeah. through films and yeah. commercials. It, they can't, it's as good as having a hit record. Yeah. So then, Colin Blunston, 2017, 2018, what's, what's, uh, what's going to be happening? Well, I think over the summer, uh, I know the Zombies are playing a lot of festivals over the summer, and, you know, normally you play festivals at the weekend. So that will give me the weeks free, and I'll be starting to collect songs and also write songs for my next solo album. And I'm hoping that I can get an album ready for early next year. I mean, I've got my fingers crossed for that. It's a tight schedule, but I, I certainly will try and do it. Do you, do you enjoy doing festivals? Yeah, I do. I like the ver variety in playing uh, um, 
live. I love playing really small, intimate venues as well, mm -hmm. where often the audience is right on top of yeah. you, yeah. and it's a completely different feeling to playing a festival where you might have 30 or 40,000 people there. And, and I, I just enjoy the variety, I really do. No, I, I can remember when uh, with Sad Cafe we did um, Glastonbury yeah. back in the day. I mean, there was only one stage then, but it was absolutely awesome to see that the the, the crowd like spreading Absolutely. right we out. We played Glastonbury last year, funnily right, enough. Right. Um, it's a bit different now, though, isn't it? Well, it's a huge, huge concern now. I mean, I yeah. was fascinated by it, uh, and and a very good vibe as well. I've often wondered, you know, what the atmosphere would be like with so many people roaming around, but. It's, it's a wonderful, warm, family feeling at Glastonbury. Mm. And another one is the Isle of Wight Festival. It's another yeah. great festival as well, which yeah. we've played and thoroughly enjoyed. Um, yeah, I love playing festivals. Right. Well, Colin, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so and, much. Uh, well, thank you for coming and visiting us. All the best with your gig. Thank you. And all the best for the future. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the show. It's been Pleasure. really enjoyable. Thank you, Colin. So, join me next time for another guest in the entertainment world on Life Stories. Thank you.